All right. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, we're so happy you could join us. Um, today, we are going to talk about data ethics. Um, but before I get into introducing very, very esteemed colleagues today, I just wanted to say, if you missed the opening webinar about the Digital Justice Grant Program, where I talked about the parameters of the program, the ethos, we did a deeper dive into the eligibility requirements and the application components, and also had a mini discussion about the difference between the seed and development grants. You can check out that recording on the ACLS site on the Digital Justice um, Supplementary Materials Program page. So let's just jump into it. I'm very, very excited to have with us today Professor Kim Gallen, who is an Associate Professor of Africana Studies at Brown University. Her work has been supported by the American Council of Learning Societies, we have good judgment, uh, National Endowment for the Humanities, the Social Science Research Council, and the Spencer Foundation. She's also served on a number of national grant review committees. We're also joined by Lael Hughes-Watkins, who's the Associate Director of Engagement, Inclusion, and Reparative Archives and Special Collections and University Archives at the University of Maryland College Park. And this is a newly established position for the university. She's a member of the, of, she's a founding, founder of Project Stand, the first of its kind uh, that's a collaborative effort among archival repositories within academic institutions across the country to create an online portal featuring analog and digital collections that document student activism that primarily focuses on historically marginalized communities. So Professor Gallen. Kim, please. Okay, Kim, Kim and Leo. So like I said, I'm so uh, happy that they both agreed to join us today uh, because really the idea of starting this webinar series emerged from different conversations with the both of them around the importance of foregrounding data ethics more explicitly in the application materials. And of course the importance of providing some resources for folks as they think about this new component of the application. And so the first uh, sort of thing that we're gonna do today is just really have a general discussion about what we mean by data ethics um, and sort of talk about what that might look like in the application. And then we'll move into uh, two breakout sessions. So uh, Kim will be leading one and Leo will be leading one. I will um, join Leo in one room. My colleague, James Shulman, who's the vice president of ACLS will join Kim in the other, where we really give uh, everyone an opportunity to engage in smaller group discussions around this question. And you can also feel free to sort of talk about the specific of your project um, and sort of, you know, get feedback uh, and sort of engage in the brain trust in the world. So I do want to note before we jump in that this session is recording. The first half of it, the general discussion, will be recorded so that those folks who could not join us because of scheduling commitments um, or anything like that can, can watch it asynchronously. But the discussions in the smaller group sessions will not be recorded just to respect people's privacy if they are going to talk about their, their projects. And so with all of that said, I wanna ask everyone you know, in the audience, um, if you could quickly just in the chat, right? Answer the question, what is data ethics to you? What does that phrase invoke? And just a few sort of quick words, I'll give folks uh, 30 seconds or so um, to put some answers into the chat to just start us off with this discussion. All right, so I see some some answers coming into the chat. I'm just gonna read these aloud for folks. So we have one answer that data ethics is about moral conversations about data, okay? It's about caring and being cautious with what others share with us and how we share it with others. Data ethics means to me protecting the people I work with, right? Data justice, fairness and privacy, respect, privacy, and includes morals include morals into numbers. That's an interesting phrasing, right? So as more answers come in, um, I wanna sort of pose the first question to our interlocutors, Kim and Lael today. Um, when you look at these answers of how folks think of, of data ethics, do any, does anything resonate with you? Do you see any common, commonalities between how you approach data ethics or how you define data ethics in your own work? I, I guess I can go first, Leo. Is that okay? Okay. 
Um, yeah, thanks. First of all, uh, Kiana, thanks for having me a part of this really important conversation. You know, as soon as I got the invitation, I immediately say, said yes, because I think these are the types of conversations that are important just in the context of, you know, the projects like this, but in, in a broader culture. And so when I look at people's, um, what people are putting in the chat, they, they absolutely resonate with how I think about uh, data ethics, right, where people are at the center of these ethical conversations around data. Um, care comes up a lot in these uh, comments and these uh, suggestions. Um, protection, care, you know, respect, all those things are really important. But I also like to think about data ethics in a much more broader landscape. I mean, ethics is part of that, right? And so I think anyone thinking about a data ethics plan, data ethics have to start thinking about what ethics means to them and whether ethics is something that's relative or whether there's an absolute conceptualization of ethics in a broader sense, and then think about how that then comes to resonate with your project, right? Um, and what that means for your project. So uh, absolutely all of this resonates with me, but I would love to, hopefully we can dig into a little bit more deeper about the nuances of, of data ethics. It's hard to come after Kim with such a thorough answer. <laughs> um, but yes, um, again, just also resonating with um, words such as in terminology, uh, care um, and community and, and individuals. Um, thinking about, um, I think someone else said, putting humanizing numbers or, or putting a person beh behind numbers. And so that is so critical. Um, Oftentimes we do look at data points and those data points are connected to stories, but sometimes we don't always go to that extra layer to talk about what those stories and what those communities and individuals that's behind those data points. And so I definitely think that's very critical to this conversation and glad that that has been mentioned um, by one of our attendees. But I do love what, um, another thing that I really love what Kim just said about thinking about the more nuances um, I'm so glad that, again, invited to this conversation. Um, I really appreciate the approach that ACLS does uh, to this work. Um, it's, it's not normal. <laughs> so they're leading, leading the ground um, in, this, in this approach to doing um, grant, grants and having these conversations. So just, again, appreciate it. Um, but those nuances around ethics, that's why I really love this question, because how everyone in this space may define what ethics is or define what data, that is a very nuanced conversation. So, you know, even the people on your team that you're running a grant with may have a different definition of ethics and you need to make sure y'all are all on a sim same page or similar page um, as, as you're working on, through this grant process. Thank you for that. I mean, I love the phrasing of the story behind the data, right? Because we're all, you know, humanists. Uh, in one way or another, and storytelling is our bread and butter. So having a focus on the story behind the, the data uh, is really important. And so I do want to dig a little bit into sort of what we mean by data, right, and what we mean by ethics. And so as you think about your own work or projects that you've supervised, um, what kinds of conversations have you had with your team to get started on coming to a sort of uh, shared definition of both of those terms? Leo, I'm going to let you start this time, so I'm going to yield to you. I'm still processing that question. Um, so I'm going to start. So... I do think when you think about um, startup versus um, startup versus established projects, um, I, I think with startups, it's, it's really important to be very clear about who you, you brought to the table, who you're bringing to the table to start your work. I do think there needs to be an acknowledgement that sometimes if people start doing a startup, may not have made all the connections to maybe create the visibility for their for their work in those be beginning stages. So I think it's really important to try to build those relationships as you're entering into that process so that you have people that's a part of your process that'll help you advocate for the importance and value of the, of the work that you're engaging in. I do think with more established projects, I think that's also a 
point to try to course correct um, during that process? Um, what have been some things that you could um, build on or or uh, make adjustments in? Were some voices that weren't included in your work early on that you now realize um, that you you need to include and make sure you again bring to the table for this stage um, of your work? So there's there's definitely benefits to being a starter because you can really really think broad and, and wide in, in, in that beginning stage. But I do think some of the other benefits when you're established is you have that moment to course correct because there's there should be lessons that's been um, learned if, if you're more established projects. Yeah, thanks, Leah. That's You got me thinking about some of these, um, as you said, the nuances and then Kiana, the story behind the data. Um, and so, again, just sort of to ground us, like if you were to Google data ethics, most of them is going to talk about most frameworks, whether it's in business, whether it's in nonprofits, whether it's in academic institutions, are going to broadly give you some helpful but starting language about um, protecting, uh, sharing, how to share, collect, protect even process data to make sure that, you know, you're not harming people. And many of us, um, if you're an academic, have institutional review boards, right, that help you, guide you on your data um, plan, right? Data sustainability, making sure that if it's human subject research, your, your data plan, your data ethics plan can, um, you know, make sure it passes these specific guidelines. But I think when we're doing the work around digital justice, where we're trying to do reparative work using data, and that could be unstructured data where it's more stories um, and text based, and it could be quantitative data where it really is focused on numbers. I think it's important for us to think about um, the relationship that people have to data and then the relationship that people have to people who've been the data gatekeepers or the data collectors, right? Um, and to think about the history of that data in that particular community or that particular context and what that relationship and what that history has been before you can really start thinking about what ethical data practices look like, right? So if you're dealing with communities that historically have been the subject of data collection and that lived experience and knowledge has been passed down from you know, generations, there's gonna be a, a particular relationship to data that you're gonna have to really dig in to think about when you think about data ethics. And so um, when we think about this as a, a framework for thinking about what data ethics looks in our, in our projects, I think we have to think and really historicize and think really deeply about um, what the data ethics are. So in the work that I do, and right now most of my work is in Providence around data, black and brown communities around data, you know, one of the first things that we're doing is asking what people, what their definition of data is. Right. Um, and starting there in terms of to think about what a data ethics plan might look like. And if there's anything you can share with us about what you're finding so far in terms of people's definition of data, I'm, I'm yeah. curious if you can share. Uh, I wouldn't I can't share yet because we are just coming up with the, the interviews like so we are doing we, I can share tell you what the um, the design of the project is we uh, have identified community organizations and community leaders and we're asking them to tell us what their um, what they believe is data what their data plan uh, structures are. Um, whether they have one or not, and then what do they believe their community's relationship to data might be. So we're using them as our sort of insight into community. And um, in the spring, we hope to have a, a data toolkit for researchers who are researching communities on how to think for Black and Brown communities, how to think about data in relationship to those communities. Well, thank you for sharing that. I think that's a wonderful segue actually into another question, which is about how to incorporate community partners into the creation and maintenance of your, your project's data. How do you fold them into uh, your data ethics plan? And so I guess I can kick the question over uh, to Lael, especially given your title, right, um, in terms of thinking about reparative archiving. Um, and so when you think about engaging community partners and their role in the creation of a data ethics plan, um, what might you offer in terms of words of advice? Um, I, I think it's important to look for 
and and I always feel like in in this work that the people who are best suited for these conversations in the community end up making themselves known. <laughs> so you don't have to like, who should I talk to? If you're if you're doing the work, you'll end up knowing who those <laughs> who those people are. Um, and building building those relationships. I think sometimes in in the process, we we also don't always include those individuals early on in 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 our plans. And so it's really horrible. It's almost like to me, I compare it to being caught on an email thread where you should have been part of the conversation early on. And you see like 10 <laughs> conversations happening. You just get tagged on at the end. And it's like, well, we knew you were important, but <laughs> it's after all these important uh, plans and, and conversations have been had and you're, you're like the last part of the, the the process. So to me, I really think it's important when you talk about building community partners that they are part of the genesis of, of the plan and not brought in midway or at the tail end um, of, of that process. Um, I really feel that I've seen projects, even things that I've been a, a, a part of that have gone off the rails because the, your community partners will bring insight that there's just no way you were going to have that insight because you're not built in, caked in into that community, into that community in that way that they are. And so really having your community partners at the genesis of, of your project can really is important to shifting, you know, what the entire what that work is is going to look like. And so sometimes it's hard to again course correct your your work when you're bringing them in later because you're like, man, that was an excellent idea or oh wow, I, I didn't think about that. So you really don't want to to have to do the extra work of trying to adjust when you should have just included them at the genesis at the at the very beginning. Yeah, I think what Lael says is so vital. And I I'll just share a personal a personal um, story, not story, but a personal experience um, that I had just recently where uh, Lael talking about course correcting is absolutely what I had to do. I really wanted to do a project um, studying the Providence Black community's relationship to digital health and technologies. And I really do think that's important. You know, I don't take that lightly in terms of like how, um, what access to digital health might look like. But talking to community members, and I'm I'm still very new to this community. I've only been living in Providence for a little over a year. So I'm largely an outsider. My son, make, who you probably saw popping in, but uh, makes me more of an outsider, more of an insider rather to his relationship to the community. He's much more in, you know, on the ground going to community things. But what I discover is that in terms of community needs, that's not really the real sort of front and center community needs or interest. And so uh, like Lael said, I, I course correct it because, um, and I'm not suggesting this is for everyone or everyone has the latitude to do this, but I, I, I do wanna do work that's driven by community interest and need. And while again, I, I will engage that work of looking at digital health technologies in another context, in the context of really being on the ground and doing work with communities and for communities, I, I course corrected because I knew that there were other needs. So this is not to say that in developing community partners, you scrap your whole project. And I certainly have, I've just sort of shifted. It is to say that, you know, if you bring community in, there's a there should be a willingness to listen to community and maybe adjust the project. If it really is about justice, the community really should be driving what justice looks like. You may have a a really good idea of what's needed, and you may even be right. So that's not even um, it's not about being right or wrong, but it's about what is necessary and more importantly, what the community is ready for, right? In terms of how they might uh, receive a plan around justice. Um, and I, I would argue that the community is more likely to adopt and be interested and engage a, a project, a plan um, that is driven by their needs and their interests. And so I think, you know, with real careful, thinking you could um you know hopefully thread that needle and and speak to both community and the work of the project. Kian, if I could just say one thing about the um established projects and the um startup projects. I think again Liel touched on some really good points. You know, if you're an established project and you are trying to think about data in relationship to a data ethics plan or establishing community partners, um 
I would suggest that one of the things that you might think about is how, if you're up and running, how a data ethics plan aligns with your vision of the project, right? So this is not just about data, it's also about the vision of the project. So if you, and this gets back to, again, what you think ethics are, you know, a lot of the work of projects is actually very philosophical. Like, what are the ethics? What are the morals of the project? What are the morals and ethics of the people engaged in that project? And so people who have an established project should sort of do a check-in with the project themselves, the people who are working on the team, and try to build a data ethics plan that really aligns with a larger sort of ethos of the project. I would argue if you're just starting your project, this is an incredible opportunity to build with community, to create a data ethics plan that grows um, and has the flexibility to change as necessary. Again, not drastically. I think there are some core principles of data ethics around care, uh, protection, thinking really critically about when and when not to share data. But I think the nuances of the project and the nuances of the data ethics plan can really grow together and be more mutually constituent. So I think both projects, the established one and then the startup have a really incredible rich opportunity to do work that really deeply reflects the project or the organization. Thank you for sharing uh, those thoughts, Kim, because I was I was going to ask about that pivot moment, right? Like if you already do have an established project and you want to take on more intentionally this question of data ethics, but you haven't sort of folded in the partners in the same way um, that both you and Leo have talked about, how does one sort of make that um, pivot? And also it, in with respect to the genre of grant writing, how do you sort of be honest about that and fold it into the sort of work plan or what you hope to do um, as part of what your, your proposed activities, right? I'll just jump in and I would love to hear what Leo says. That, you know, the I like grant writing, it's weird. I don't, I never thought that I would, but I, I enjoy grant writing um, because I think the opportunity to tell a story in, a, in such a compelling way and to make a case for why a project and why the, the story that you have to tell about the project, it merits the support of, you know, a various organization. And here, I think if that, if that is the case, you're an established project and you realize that, you know, you um, maybe misstepped or could have done a better job or you're coming into establishing community partners relatively late. Tell that story. Tell the story about this as a moment and an opportunity to do what other organizations haven't done or what other projects haven't done. And that because of this opportunity, you believe that you can establish a much richer, much deeper um, project that really will reflect the community um, that you want to work with. Practically, you know, because that's the story that you tell, practically, there is some real work that you need to do um, to actually establish those uh, relationships and not in a very superficial way, but more in a substantive way. So, um, I found myself absolutely in the same position as much as intellectually, I know that in order to work with communities, you need to build relationships. I was still letting the institution where I work drive the timeline of getting this project through IRB and up and running. And I stopped the IRB process and realized that this project was gonna fail if I didn't actually spend the time getting to know the community. And so I'm fortunate enough, and I had the luxury of having funding where um, several of my um, people that work on my team at Brown, um, uh, so a couple of them are students, but others are not students. They, I dedicate one hour of their time in the community working as a volunteer in a community organization one day a week. And then I started actually working in the community on the weekends for a particular organization. It means the process is slowed down. It means that you know the IRB is gonna go in in the spring, not the fall like I want it to. But you know, if we're really going to be about justice and doing this work, there are going to be times we have to slow down. So tell tell that story. Also tell how you plan to course correct and and establish a much more meaningful relationship to the community. Kim, I feel like just that part right there was like a masterclass of course correction and vulnerability. Like I so appreciate you sharing that. Um, like truly, I, I like if you're if you're in that 
when you're in that moment, you have that realization. I think that level of transparency is so important because personally, trust and believe there's somebody in the group or a couple of people in the group who know that there's a course correction that should should happen. And they're like waiting for you to say something and then better if you don't, <laughs> don't say anything. And so to have that vulnerability and to say, you know what, um, team or 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 community community partners, like I have not, I have I have not done my due diligence in this area. I'm I'm seeing that we're challenged in this area and I really want to take a pause or or slow down like you're like you're doing to really get in more um feedback and and listen and and do the project at the the pace that it needs to go at, not that what you're being told it needs that it needs to go at, and let that process be more um, organic. Because yes, institutions will put you on timelines that you're just like, this is crazy. I, I really can't do this, and that and that is part of the problem with um, trying to have a more thoughtful relationship and process with community partners because they have their own timeline <laughs> and when they're going to get to you and talk to you and and work with you. And so that is such a process. And, that, and their timeline is never on the institution's timeline. <laughs> so you have we have to bend to them, not not the other, not always the other way around. And so um, I think just having that transparency and vulnerability, I just really appreciate you um, sharing that because I, I think that that and. I don't know what the word I'm looking for, but I just think that makes a stronger connection with the community partner that, that you're working with and, and people appreciate honesty and acknowledging when you've made a misstep. And I, I just think that makes people want to work with you more and 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 fully trust you um, when you're willing to, to make those um, acknowledgements. Yeah, thank you both for those uh, comments. I'm, re I'm reminded of two things. One is that I do want to make clear also to the, the folks in the audience, uh, the prospective applicants, that you know there is a real pressure to perform a return on investment with grant writing. And we want to try to encourage folks to do something a little bit different in terms of the way that they're crafting their materials for this program, because, you know, as you know, my colleague James always says so well, like we are invested in the work of field building, which requires a little bit of risk taking, requires a little bit of vulnerability, requires sort of that pause and that intentionality to sort of um, build the relationships that are actually going to sustain a project over the long term, right? And so if we take the pressure to sort of perform an assuredness that's perhaps not there and sort of uh, lean into that vulnerability in terms of talking about the story of how a project has unfolded, whether that's for a seed project or for a development project, those are really, um, you know, the, the vividness of those projects really jumps out on the page, I always think. Um, and I really want to sort of underscore that we want to encourage folks to, to sort of think about that because the reality is no matter what happens, whether or not you you do all of the things you said you were going to do in your project timeline in the way that you said, or you didn't and you, you know, came across a lot of mishaps, all of that is useful information for the next phase of the project, right? This is an iterative long-term process. So any data, uh, you know, to use that word, any data in terms of the process is, is useful and helpful for moving things forward. The other thing that I want to lift up that I find interesting about this um, sort of discussion on data ethics is sort of the ways in which folks doing this work have to kind of engage in community partners and the data ethics is part of the interpersonal relationships that one establishes. Um, but I wanna, I wanna shift gears a little bit to talk about sort of, um, I guess in some ways like the data that will live on servers or on our computers, like how does one ethically engage with the data that's collected? How do you um, sort of maintain it? What sort of questions do you ask around where it lives? Who has access to it? Uh, those kinds of things. So any thoughts that you have on that would be would be great. Yeah, that those are great questions. Um... Uh, and, you know, I, I'll, I'll hearken back to some of the, I think, incredible work that's been done at other places or through other projects. I'm thinking more specifically about uh, Color Conventions Project, who um, in those questions about the, the sort of data infrastructures, um, I think they really work hard to think about who's handling the data after it's collected in terms of what the, their principles are. Right, in terms of thinking about 
um, diversity at the level of technical, of the technical apparatus in terms of like data scientists, right? And that doesn't mean that, and I'm thinking di diversity broadly here, um, you know, obviously racial and ethnic and maybe gender diversity sort of comes up to the surface, but I'm also talking about diversity in terms of praxis and um, being willing to think innovatively about the uh, the uh, data science as a field, right? So one of the things I I'm committed to doing, and it doesn't really resonate a lot with you know general data science praxis, is to be more comfortable with data that has noise in it or data that isn't necessarily uh, clean data, the data may have some outliers and figure out ways to, instead of cleaning the data, to sort of live with some of the variables. Um, so thinking about those sort of ethics of like, again, how does, um, how you collect and store and sit with the data uh, reflect more of uh, the, the justice um, objectives that you have, right? So thinking about, you know, how to sort of balance out the the sort of technical aspects of data in terms of where it is um, and how it's processed with the sort of ethical, moral justice ones are, are not easy. You know, I would encourage people to think about their infrastructure and look at platforms like Makutu, right, which is a platform that was built for indigenous communities and has all sorts of protocols built in to the infrastructure that allows access to that data from the community, right? Um, so that's one technical thing is think about your platform. Does that platform actually, is it conducive to the ethics and the justice vision that you have for the project? Um, the other thing I would think about think about if there's funding, whether through this um, program or through another, um, building your own custom data hub and then creating your own protocols that reflect the vision of your organization or your project. I know it's easier said than done, but there are a lot of open source tools out there. And with the right data scientists and the right support, you might be thinking about an infrastructure that you have to custom build because you can't have a, you don't have to see an infrastructure that actually uh, reflects the vision that you had. So those are a couple things that you might think of in terms of, of technically. Again, I don't have too much to add to that. <laughs> to that. Um, I, I, the, the fact that um, Kim mentioned Makrutu, like I, 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 like I love that as an, as an example um, because I do think, which we touched on earlier, like having that shared understanding um, about what the team decides, uh, defines as ethics, um, will impact what you decide as accessible, what looks, what accessibility to that data looks like. And so um, creating those protocols um, in a and maybe cannot necessarily do that in advance because depending on what the data looks like as as it's as it's um, coming into view is going to impact what those protocols look like. Um, but I do think as you're especially if you're going to build out um, a platform, I think even just the fact that um, Kim mentioned like if we had those data outliers, like just how are you going to manage making that that data accessible? Um, and I kind of think it would be great to document that process, like those conversations that were had to decide how you came up with the protocols that you decide to put in place or how you came to decide to build out your own platform versus the platforms that already exist and why you didn't use that. Like, I really think that could be very, uh, very valuable um, documentation and conversations um, to have for your, for your team. And if everyone's um, agreed upon it, that could be shared out and be very valuable for others also that are, are engaging in, in, in this process as well. Can I just follow up on what Leo was saying? Um, I, I, I love the fact of documenting that process. It's something that we are going to be doing with the work I'm doing with my team, documenting a process for um, sort of moving away from the racial categories that have been prescribed for us um, by the federal government. The federal government is, is, is really working hard um, under the Biden administration to, to make create more nuance around racial and ethnic categories. 
But here in Providence, like many, many communities, you know, people who are phenotypically Black may are, uh, you know, identify as Cape Verdean or, you know, Dominican or Liberian, uh, Liberian American. And so the data practice that we have here at the, the work I'm doing is that we are going to get granular in people's identity, but we have to also sit with the fact that that data is probably not going to be usable for many people outside of the Providence community, which is fine, right? We're building something for Black and Brown people in Providence. We're not building uh, a, a data, um, you know, a collection of data, quite frankly, that is supposed to be really be usable outside of the community, right? Um, and so I think that, that might be also something to consider, as as Lael said, you know, what what are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to not sacrifice in the ethics and um, the data infrastructure, the data that you build and create? Thank you. And I think that's a wonderful example of how even if the data that you're collecting is intentionally unaccessible to people outside of the particular community that you're serving, that even documenting the process, though, of how you, as Lael said, sort of come up with um, sort of your framework is still useful to others. And that's also something that I want to highlight in terms of an ongoing conversation um, that we've been having at ACLS about this particular grant program is this question of accessibility, right? Recognizing that the data that belongs to certain kinds of communities, ones that have been historically and currently still subject to online harassment, like there are parts of that data that should be, that should absolutely be protected. And so thinking a little bit more uh, intentionally about what accessibility looks like is also sort of part of, of data ethics in that way. So I want to switch uh, gears just slightly to sort of talk about, um, you know, thinking about your experience as a reviewer for various kinds of grants and fellowship competitions. Can you share, just generally speaking, any glaring red flags around data ethics that have appeared within applications? And if there are any words of caution that you might offer to prospective applicants when developing and articulating their own data ethics plan? Well, for me, it's boilerplate language. If, uh, you know, and I know people are busy and I understand that people are doing the best that they can, but, you know, some of the red flags I've seen, it's so clear that this is just boilerplate or language that is very, very general or basic. Um, like I said, you know, there are so many resources um, on data ethics, um, but, you know, uh, if you haven't really thought through uh, a data ethics plan and you're just sort of trying to find something to just sort of satisfy that part of the application, I would urge you to actually deep, deep, think more deeply about it. And to be really clear, you know, show that your data ethics plan connects with the broader vision and objectives of the project. The data ethics plan isn't the place to all of a sudden sort of talk about your commitment or your um, your ideas of what justice means. That should be something that is integrated and then shows up again in your, your ethics, uh, your data ethics plan or your data ethics strategy. Um, and then another red flag is it's, it's clear that your community partners that you are unaware or you just miss real information about your community partners that can easily be accessed by someone else. And so, um, as much as possible, a really well written but deeply uh, thought out ethics plan that actually reflects the project, the community partners. And then I would also lastly say a data ethics plan or strategy that is um, very explicit about um, or is a flexibility, not in the sense, again, that, you know, well, our data ethics plans changes as, you know, people change. Um, there certainly should be a core there, but it also should recognize the cultural specificity, should recognize times, you know, uh, change over time, the nuance of larger things that might happen. So there's a certain flexibility about the plan also. Um, just a few additional points. Just, um, I always think it's important as people are doing their data ethics plans that if they can um, draw any lines to any com comparative projects that's similar to theirs. When when I'm personally, when I'm reading a project 
And if it has any similarity to anything else that I know I'm going, and it's not reference, I'm like, mm. <laughs> do you not know? And you should know. <laughs> you know, so that's a red flag to me. Um, but uh, again, also something, your data ethics plan is realistic. I sometimes I feel like you can read a plan. I'm just like, this sounds so... <laughs> And I and I never like to tamp down anybody's light or or sunshine or 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 vision, but it also has to be realistic. And and there's going to be people in the room that's going to be reading your grant that has been doing this work or have been in relationship with people doing this work. And when something sounds so out of bounds, it's just like how are they going to do this on this timeline with this? Did they reach out to this community? And they're supposed to be doing this. This is it's like okay, this is not possible. <laughs> so you don't want to lose out on a wonderful opportunity just because you you may not have been more realistic about what's uh what your data at this point can actually um carry out so that that's just my two cents on on that point and so i think you know for the final question we could take everything that you just shared both of you just shared in the affirmative but i want to ask if there are also any green flags right that you've seen or any aspects of a data ethics plan that have been exemplary or that could provide potentially useful model uh, to others, just so that we can we can end on a relatively positive note before we head into our breakout rooms. Leo, did you have oh good. Okay. I'll just say one one quick thing, just saying that when you could tell there's been work done on the front end, that they're just not waiting for when the to get this grant approved before they start doing the work. <laughs> um, that you that you believe in your work enough that you actually started some of that on the front end um, in advance to, to, to create the environment for success and that you have that built into your conversation around your data ethics plan. I think that's, to me, that's always like impressive when you can see like they've started to lay the groundwork um, already. And, and so I think that's like a wonderful green flag that I love to see. Well, that's a good one. That is absolutely a good one. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, obviously do all the things that we said not to do as part of the, the green flags, quite frankly. Um, but I also think that having um, a, sort of a vision about the data for what, like, uh, what it can do, right? Like what the, the possibilities of what the data can do. Um, in terms of being part of the transformative change, that the data is not just uh, data that is either going to be um, collected and, and sort of static, but what the data ethics plan can sort of do for uh, a longer visions of the project and then the sort of longer vision of social justice outside of that specific project. You know, when I can see projects that can actually think um, um, or ethics. And again, this doesn't, you know, I'm not asking for people to come up with some grand scheme of how to, you know, solve some of the more long-term systemic issues, but a nod to how the data ethics uh, strategy plan uh, might have a broader life outside of the specific project, though that's a real green flag. Wonderful. Well, thank you both for engaging in what I felt like was a very rich sort of discussion um, to get us primed to go into our breakout rooms. So I'm going to um, pause the recording now. Um, okay, wonderful. So thank you all for attending. And I hope that I genuinely hope that this was helpful and that you got some good feedback or just different um, sort of things to consider as you're crafting your applications. Riska, could you share your screen um, so that I can go through some just some dates? So just wanted to reiterate that the deadline for applications is December 15th at 9 p.m. This also includes the institutional verification that the administrator has to submit on your behalf. So if you're at all on the fence about um, applying, I would still sort of start the application and note which administrator is gonna fill this out for you so that the um, our online fellowship application portal can send that to them as soon as possible. It is a very, very quick form. It is not a letter of recommendation. It is a series of three check boxes with a small fill-in field that gives us a little bit more information about the uh, sort of technological infrastructure that would be available to you should you get the grant funds. 
And so once the application closes in mid-December, we'll have our selection committee meetings in March and then notify folks via email in May. Next slide, please. I also wanted to lift up uh, the other webinars that are coming down the pipeline. So in a couple of weeks, we'll be joined by Professor uh, Rio Morimoto, who's at uh, Princeton, and Dr. Lorena Goodthrow, who's at the University of Houston, and they'll be talking about capacity building and what that looks like for the appropriate scale for seed projects. Then we'll be joined by Marissa Parham a few weeks later to talk about what that looks like for development grants. And if at any point you have further questions um, about your application, you can attend one of the applicant Q and A's, which will feature um, ACLS staff. And those are very, very informal. They're kind of just pop in, hey, I have a quick question about this. Could I get some FaceTime? Um, so I definitely recommend attending those uh, if you have, if you just want to chat. All of these recordings, uh, with the exception of the Q and A's, will be available on the ACLS Digital Justice Supplementary Materials page. So if you can't make any of those, any of the ones coming up, you can still access the recording. Next slide. All right, so that is it. Thank you. Best of luck in your application. I also want to extend a warm thank you to both Kim and Lael for joining us today, for giving us some of their time. This is a real sort of new effort that we're trying to do in terms of giving folks uh, more resources, resources in terms of how to um, sort of think about their applications and craft materials. So I'm so grateful that you both agreed to, to join us today. And I hope that this was helpful to everyone who attended. Thank you and good luck everyone. Yes, good luck.